Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. It's so good to see everyone this morning. If you're our guest, we're especially glad that you've chosen to come and worship here with us this morning. If you'll just text welcome to the number you see up there on the screen. And also you can pick up a welcome bag on the way out there at the Welcome Center just to say thank you for joining us this morning. And we're so excited to see everyone as now school's kind of settled back in and we're everywhere. everyone's getting back into a routine. But we still have a few things left around here we're kicking off and that's going to be Awana is going to kick off for our children on Wednesday nights. So that's going to be September the 7th. So make sure you've gone and, and registered your child for that or your grandkid or encourage your neighbors to come up for that. Also on September the 7th, we're going to be kept kicking off some new connection groups. So we have like a, a men's Bible study. There's going to be a women's Bible study group. There's uh, several connection groups that meet during that time. Financial Peace is going to be on there. So a lot of those to see all the offerings that we have for Wednesday nights and also on Sunday mornings because connection groups are important. That's where life takes place, and we really want to get everyone here connected into a small group because that's really where you kind of walk through life together and be able to dive into God's Word together. And a great place to go look is get on our church app, Church Center app, and you can find listed on there. All the small groups are on there that are going to be meeting coming up on September the 7th. All those. Also, if you want to pick one of these up at the front desk, it has a list of all the small groups. Or you can go to our website. All three of those places are great places for that. Uh, Financial Peace University, you can go under events and sign up for that one. If you want to sign up for that starting on Wednesdays, is a great opportunity. Uh, also, we are excited. Uh, late last night, our mission team made it back from Honduras. So we have a worship leader this morning. So we're excited about that. So welcome back, John. Thank you for the prayers for, uh, for the, the team. It was a great, great week. We saw God moving and working in, in amazing ways, and we would go back there in a heartbeat uh, at, at the first opportunity. So thank you so very much for the prayers. Uh, we saw God working in amazing ways. But we learned as much as, uh, as those people learned. We learned how to uh, be contented with, with uh, the things that God has given us. And uh, anyway, if ever there's an opportunity for you to go and serve in missions, pray that you that you'd take up uh, the opportunity to do that. Today we've come to worship. Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing from the bottom of our heart to a, to a loving God, an amazing God, a God who loves us, a God who's worthy of our praise. Let's celebrate. I 
of your son. Lord, have freedom today to do just that. God, that's our prayer today. In the name above every name, the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. There's a verse of scripture that that, we, that was shared this week while we were, uh, while we were in Honduras uh, digging water wells, uh, trying to get water to uh, an, at an elementary school of 600 little children whose uh, teachers and administrators have been praying for two years for water. A verse that says in Isaiah 55, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest Affair, you know, um, if you if you know what happened this week, we were able to hit water because of a, a situation with a with a rock formation that covered uh, probably more than a city block, and we just couldn't penetrate through. But uh, we were able to share with children and teachers, mainly through a lot of our our ladies. Uh, riches that just money couldn't money couldn't buy uh, and so they were they were they were blessed we were blessed and uh, I for one won't be the same because of that beautiful experience and uh, so thankful so thankful that we discovered the goodness of God and we're going to sing about that so would you join with us as we sing
Well, good morning, church. We are glad that you're here. And when I say we're glad you're here, I mean it. Uh, Not just so we can all get together and hang out on a Sunday morning, though I do enjoy that aspect of it, but so we can grow in God's word and grow in our faith, uh, grow in community here together. Wasn't it a great time of worship uh, this morning uh, to be reminded that we run to the Father, that whatever's going in our life, we can take it to God. You know, I'm reminded with my own kids as they continue to grow up and they find themselves in situations where they might be in trouble. You know, I don't want them to say, I have to figure this out myself. I can't call my dad because he's going to kill me. I want them to say, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. I better call my dad because I know he loves me and we'll figure this out together. In church, that is where we are as believers. We have this father that we can bring everything to. So this morning as we begin, let's say a quick word of prayer together and ask the Lord to just bless our time in the Word. Bow with me this morning, if you will. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning uh, after just a time of worship um, to reflect on who you are, that you're good, that you're kind, that you're loving, Lord, but that also you are God and you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I pray that this morning as we open your Word that you would speak to us, reveal truth to us. I pray that when we leave here this morning, we would be different than when we arrive. Lord, we bless you and give you all praise, glory, and honor. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Well, when I was growing up, I frequently heard the saying, and maybe you've heard it before, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Uh, Boy, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You better step back. You better think, you better analyze, what am I doing, where am I going? Because if we don't check ourselves, there could be consequences. We must constantly analyze the way that we live, who we are, where we're headed, but especially as Christians. We are to take inventory of our lives and see where we're at, who we are, where we're headed, to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Now, we could wax a little more eloquent and say it this way. Uh, Plato said it this way, the unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, there should be this constant examination process in our lives where we ask ourselves, who am I really? Not who do I present to other people, but who am I really? And so our main thought this morning, we're going to close out the first chapter in Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up Philippians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 27. And everything we're talking about together today hangs on this verse. Philippians 1, 27, Paul writes this. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And in this, I'm offering this invitation for us to check ourselves, to examine our lives, to see this morning, to ask, is my life worthy of of the gospel? Is how I'm living worthy of the gospel? Am I consistent? Am I talking it but also walking it? This morning I want us to check ourselves and to ask that question to examine our hearts and minds. Is my life worthy of the gospels? You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Now you say what do you mean by wreck ourselves? Because as believers there's no sin we can do that undoes our salvation. Thank the Lord. But certainly We can wreck our testimony by the way that we choose to live. Certainly, we can rob ourselves of joy by the way that we choose to live. Certainly, we can lose the closeness and the intimacy we have with Christ by the decisions that we make on a daily basis and by the way that we choose to live. We can put our lives at odds with the gospel when we invite difficulty into our lives by the way that we live. Am I living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. I want us to think through how do we live our lives worthy of the gospel. You know, as Paul writes to the Philippians, and we garner so much insight from this, we've noticed and have said that you see so much joy in his writings. It's because Paul loved this assembly, but the Philippian church is one of the most healthiest, mature churches that we see in the New Testament. However, they still had some problems. Now, why is that? Because anytime you put two people in a room and they do life together long enough, there's going to be some, some problems that come up. But Paul knew that it's easy for people, that it's easy for churches to slip into problems, whether that be in a church false teaching, 
not staying true to what Scripture teaches, whether that be fighting among members, whether that be apathy of just doing the same thing, getting in routine, and this is just good enough. We'll just enjoy time together and forget that there's a lost and dying world, whether that be moral failure. Paul knew, as we know, as individuals and churches, that it's easy for problems to crop up in our lives. So we check ourselves. We examine our lives. And so this morning, if you've got Scripture, we're going to just read our text. We're going to finish out Philippians 1, verses 27 through 30. That's read it, and then we'll digest it a little bit. Verse 27, Paul writes, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He says in verse 28, and not frightened by anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Now this morning, if you're taking notes, I want us to see in verse 27. Christian, you are to conduct yourself in a worthy manner. Christian, I am to conduct myself in a worthy manner. Now let me remind you of this, church. Every time I get to stand up here on Sunday and share God's word and preach God's word, I want to remind you of this, that God preaches his word to me first. And so everything that God says, I'm under conviction with as well. And we are in this together. Um, This is God speaking to all of us. So he says, conduct yourself in a worthy manner. Am I living in a worthy manner of the gospel? Now, the word at the beginning of verse 27, only, um, it's to add emphasis. Paul is essentially saying this, above all all else like this is important above all else you should live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ well that makes us ask this question what is the gospel what's this incredible good news it's the story of Jesus and it's coming and it's being born in a in a lowly manger and whether you like it or not Christmas is going to be upon us like this church but it's about his coming and being born in a manger, and living this perfect, sinless life, and then dying this gruesome death for my sins, in my place, in your place. And it's about his resurrection, his power over death and sin and sorrow, and his ascension into heaven. It's about hope and love and mercy and grace. Paul says, let your life be worthy of that. Live a life consistent with the gospel. Am I doing that? Paul calls us, Christ calls us to live with integrity. That is to say, who I am at home should match who I am at church. Who I am at church should match who I am at work. My thought life should be equal to what I speak with other people. What happens when no one else is around should be consistent when there's a room full of people. We should be living moral lives where we honor God in word and deed and in our bodies across the board. Because when the world looks at the church and it doesn't see the good, the true, the beautiful, it doesn't see pureness and integrity, Paul would say we cast the gospel in a negative light. And here's what I know, that the church, the world is watching. Everything that we do, all eyes are on you. I'm reminded of this with my kids. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, it works this way. The things you want them to see, they don't always see. The things you don't want them to see in your life, they pick up on it every time. Your habits, your struggles, your difficulties. Church, the world is watching us. Let me remind you of this. How we live reflects on one another and it reflects on Christ. If the world sees an inconsistency in me, I say one thing and do another. I reflect on this local assembly. You reflect on this local assembly and we all reflect on Christ. We reflect on one another. So Paul says, verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent. Paul says, you know, we saw last week, Paul believed he would be released from Roman custody, acquitted under Caesar. He says, but whether I'm able to come see you or whether I'm absent, let your life, the way you live it, be worthy of the gospel. You know the old saying, if the cat's away, 
the mouse will play. Paul's saying live like the cat's here or he's not here. It's all the same. Again, integrity. What is integrity? It's consistency. It's living a life undivided, controlled character. Act like a child of God at all times. He says, verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. So Paul says, are you living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ? And then he gives us, he's fixing to give us this picture of what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel. He's fixing to break it down. Now, can somebody turn this on for me, this uh, beautiful guitar of Mr. Bickham's? Now, I know of no better way to break down Paul's first point here of standing firm than to quote that great theologian and poet Tom Petty. And Tom Petty said it this way. Let me see something here. Are we in the right? Okay, here we go. He said, Well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I'll stand my ground. And I won't back down. Now, Paul says if you're going to live a consistent life, he says to stand firm. Now, there's not a lot of places where the Apostle Paul and Tom Petty overlap. <laughs> but this is one, and, and Paul's thought here is Christian. Don't back down. Paul says to stand firm. Now, the Greek word here for firm is stako, which literally means, to quote Tom Petty, hold your ground and don't back down. It was often used of, of soldiers who were told, hold this position even if it means they take your life. Now, church, we talk about this sometimes. Why are we Christians? Why am I a Christian? Because it's true. Because it reflects reality. And because it's true, as a Christian, I cannot back down. I have to stand my ground, and that means that I stand on God's word, on God's truth. It means that I'm passionate about my convictions, that I don't water things down. I live a life worthy of the gospel by standing firm and by not backing down. This is in regards to both what is true and also how I live. I stand firm on truth. I should be unwavering and stand fast. I stand for truth in a world of falsehood, but I also stand for righteousness in a world of sinful entanglements. Now, can I be completely honest with you, church? We live in a very confused society. And the society that we live in thinks that there is no capital T, single, overarching truth. That you can have yours and that I can have mine and we can just all, we don't want to challenge one another. Just let everybody have their own truth and everybody can live happily ever after. I don't think that's how it works. Because something can't be true and not true in the same way at the same time for the same group of people. Let me remind you of this too. Neither is truth determined by the majority. Right is right and wrong is wrong. No matter how many people hold a position. Now you might not like the truth, but as the saying goes, facts don't care about your feelings. You can have your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own truth. What does Paul say? He says, stand your ground. Church, I believe we live in a time where so many people are scared to tell the truth. Now, caveat, Ephesians, we looked at this when we looked at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Speak the truth in love. You tell people the truth, not just because you want to poke them in the eye, but because you actually care for them. You know, I ask my wife all the time, hey, tell me, what do you think about this? Be honest. And sometimes she'll say, mm-mm, not a good idea. I want her to let me know that because I know she loves me. Well, what if it hurts their feelings? Well, what if it does? Is lying to them better? Are we loving to people by lying to them? Think about it this way. I'd hate to go to a doctor and him lie to me because he's worried about my feelings. 
Well, the screening show that you have cancer, but that's going to give you a really bad week. So I'm just going to tell you everything is good, and you can go about your, your, your happy way. It's like that so often what's happening in our society. We stand firm on truth because we love people. For no other reason, well, what if people get offended? Well, what if they do? I get offended by the truth all the time. But let's just be offended together, shall we? Let's do something about it. You don't love people by lying to them. So Paul says, stand on the truth. Don't back down. Church, don't make me get the guitar back again. Stand your ground. We need Christians in this moment to stand firm. We'll get to that a little more later when we get to the end of what Paul's saying. But he says this in verse 27. He says that I may hear, whether I'm with you or whether I'm not, that you stand firm in one spirit with one mind. Now notice the word spirit there isn't capitalized. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about this collected human spirit. How do we live in a manner worthy of the gospel? Paul says you stand firm, one spirit, one mind. A simple way to say that is this, we're better together. Church, we are far better together than we are separately. Paul says to the Philippians, he would say to us that church should be this place of harmony, of unity, a place where we stand together, we stand our ground together, where we serve together, we work together, because we're better together. But you know what grieves me at times is that so many churches are anything but united. Now think about this. As members of a church together, we have a common leader, Jesus Christ. We have a common way of doing life. We have something that directs us in every area. Christians should be the most united people in the world, but sadly we are not. Can I remind you of something? Other people are not your enemy. Other Christians specifically are not your enemy. Jesus told his disciples, John 13, he says, a new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another. He says, the way that the world will know that you belong to me is that you love one another. And so as members of the body of Christ, if we hope to live a life worthy of the gospel, we have to do well at loving each other. To overlook one another's faults. When somebody does us wrong, to forgive them. You really only have three choices. You can stay mad at them the rest of your life and bitter. You can forgive them. Or you can just say, you know what, this really isn't that big of a deal and I'm kind of being a little petty. Not Tom petty, but petty nonetheless overlook one another's faults church we ain't got no time i know that's bad english we ain't got no time for pettiness we're on a mission we have to be the church church isn't a place you go it's who you are and so when we leave these doors we are the church whether we gather here together whether we're at home whether we're at work whether we're getting the tires rotated everywhere you go united one spirit one mind so be kind and compassionate, tender-hearted, Paul would tell the Ephesians, forgiving one another as Christ forgives you. You know what? Relationships are hard. That's what the church is. It's a group of relationships with one another and with Christ. Relationships are not always easy, but for such a time as this, the world has to see Christians unified, towing the line, standing their ground, one mind, one spirit. We're so much better together. Paul goes on, verse 27. He says that I may hear that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, this is verse 27, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Side by side. Let's say it this way. When the team wins, I win. Now the word Paul uses or the phrase Paul uses for striving side by side is soon athleo. It's where we get our word athletics. And what Paul is speaking of is us striving together in cooperation on the same team. Church, we're on the same team. Christians are not in competition with one another. Now, here's my prayer. In the city of Orange, every church that's here that is doctrinally pure, we should pray that they all thrive and succeed and do well. Why is that? Because when the team wins, I win. Across the United States, our prayer should be that those faithful churches that are standing their ground, that are not backing down, that are in one mind and one spirit, that they thrive and succeed, that we strive together. It's us against Satan. It's us against sin. It's us against a pagan culture. When the team wins, we win. Now, here's what I know. I have watched two sports teams play, and you can clearly see that one team is more talented than the other. But if they don't play well together and the other team does, it might be an incredibly different ball game. We have to be people 
that play well together. Because when the team wins, I win. And in ministry and in service and Christianity, there's no position that's more important than the other. Pitcher's important, but also so is the center fielder. Everybody is in this together, and when the team wins, I win. Everyone plays their part. So let me ask you what? Ask you this. Are you playing on the team? If not, it's time to suit up and it's time to get in the game. Are you striving side by side with the other people that are in this room with you? Let me remind you, we have a brand new children's minister. This was her first week of work here. She's knocking it out of the park. Last week, we had nearly 100 kids here in Sunday service across both services. Tell you what, she could use some people to strive side by side with her. And you say, well, you know what, I can't make a commitment every week for the rest of my life. Well, just make a commitment once a month for the rest of your life. I mean, it's not too big, of a, too big of an ask, right? Or even for a season. Talk to Cassie. Say, you know what? I want to offer, this is what I have. Let me serve in this capacity. Christ wants you striving in an area of service. Let's be the church. Strive side by side. But we don't just strive to advance the faith. We also strive to mind the gap. Going back to standing firm. We as a group stand amidst the pagan culture that is hostile to Christianity. Where there are plenty of poor ideas that challenge Christianity. But the truth is on our side. But here's the difficulty. Sometimes these these poor ideas infiltrate into the church, and I see it often. Ideas like progressive Christianity that basically says the Bible is not entirely accurate, that, you know, serving the Lord is a good thing, but he didn't really die for your sins and he wasn't resurrected. Um, of, Of a poor sexual ethic, this idea that what I do with my body doesn't matter as long as I have the right beliefs. Or the prosperity gospel that God just wants to bless me so I come to church with my hands open and say, hey God, fill them up. Or works-based salvation, we could go on and on, but the church body, especially for such a time as this, had better be striving together. And as we assemble as Christians, we have to remember every time we open our word that the Lord has placed in our hands. That we don't open our Bibles or listen to God's word to be affirmed, we open our Bibles to be transformed. And so many churches today want to just affirm you, affirm you, affirm you. It's okay, it's okay. It doesn't matter how you live your life. We're glad you're here. No, I don't want to be affirmed, church. I want to be transformed. I want to be made into something different. I want to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. And my prayer is that you do too. And we strive together. Paul says, if you want to live in a way that's worthy of the gospel, look at verse 28. He says, don't be scared. Don't be frightened. He says, not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. As Christians, we don't need to be scared of anything, of other people, of what they may say, what they may do. Why is that? Because we have the truth on our side. Now, unfortunately, I see many Christians today, and sometimes I can be a little anxious myself, I get it, that are terrified by the state of Affairs in the world, specifically in this country. Let me ask you this. What do you expect? We ain't in heaven, church. The devil still roars like a lion. Expect some fallout if you are going to be in the midst of the fray. But here's what I know. We have truth. And we have a Savior. And also, I'll say this. I have read the end of the book. And it's good. You're going to like it when you get there. We have the truth, church. Paul says when you're attacked because of the gospel, when you stand because you don't back down, it's evidence that you have Christ as your Savior. Last, how do we live a life worthy of the gospel? Paul would say this. Suffer well. Look at verse 29. He says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but you should suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Have you noticed, church, the Bible talks an awful lot about suffering? Leaping off the pages of every New Testament book is this idea that Christians suffer well. You read Paul's writings, so much time, Peter's writings, so much time talking about suffering. Why do we suffer? Because we live in a fallen world that's broken, that's under this heavy curse of sin, and it touches everything. And if it makes you angry to see suffering, it does me too. It should drive us to hate sin 
all the more because ultimately all of our suffering is traced back to sin. May not be my sin, may not be your sins, but somebody's sin down the road because how we live our lives affect everyone else. And I believe this, when I choose to sin, I choose to suffer. When I willfully choose to disobey God, I willfully choose to invite suffering into my life. And maybe you say, well, so far that hasn't been the case for me. Give it time, buddy. It'll catch up to you. I promise you, when you choose to sin, it hurts you and it hurts the people around us. But here specifically, Paul is talking about believers suffering because of their faith. I don't know about you. I've had it pretty good. I haven't gone through a whole lot of persecution. can't even say anything that I've experienced has even remotely resembled persecution. I've had some people call me names. Some of them I probably deserved. I've had some people say mean things about me. But, you know, we're tempted to think because it's so good for us. It's that way for a lot of Christians, but it's simply not, church. And around the world, even in modern day, there are people that give up their lives for the cause of Christ. We've got it pretty amazing. Paul says, verse 29, For it's been granted to you... That for the sake of Christ, that God has lavished these gifts upon us, especially salvation. He says that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Here's what I'm reminded of. Christ suffered for me. So who am I to think that I can't suffer for Christ? Christ suffered for me. So when I go through those struggles, I can be reminded that there's nothing I go through that God hasn't went through himself in the person of Jesus Christ. But here's what we can know, even as we saw Last week, we can find joy in that struggle, no matter what comes into our lives. Paul says last, verse 29 and 30, For it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. He says, engage in the same conflict that you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. This is one of the things that I love about Scripture, especially the writings of Paul. Is Scripture doesn't ask us to do things that God or these apostles didn't go through themselves. Paul says, I'm telling you to stand strong in your faith and suffer well for Christ. He says, look in my own personal life. I'm doing the same thing, but we're in this together because we're better together. So suffer well. Now, church, as we close out, I want to ask you, this morning I invited you to check yourself, to examine your life. Is the way that I'm living worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is the way that I'm living worthy of this incredible blessing that God has poured out into my life? Is the way that I'm living worthy of that? But how do we do that? How do we live a life worthy of the gospel? We said this, we don't back down. We stand firm and we stand strong in the way that we live our lives and also on truth. How else do we live a life worthy of the gospel? We remember that we're better together. We're stronger together that when the team wins, I win. There's not a competition here. We all play our part. We all play our role in serving the Lord. Reminded of this as well, that we're not to be scared. No matter what happens, it's all going to be okay. So what are you scared about? What are you worried about? Maybe it's something you need to lay at the foot of the cross and say, God, as we sang this morning, I've carried this burden for too long on my own. I'm going to lay this down at your feet. How do we live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ? Church, we suffer well, you know, I'm reminded that I haven't had to do a whole lot of suffering for the cause of Christ. But maybe that day's coming, I don't know. But if it does, it does. And it's all going to be okay, so we suffer well. Church, are you living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ? That's my prayer for me, and it's my prayer for you. But I want to remind you along the way, remind, be reminded that we're in this journey together. And there are moments where we just have God lay burdens on our hearts and we need somebody to talk to. Can I remind you that here there's always someone to talk to? Somebody that you can trust that will listen to you and point you to Scripture. Church, we are always here to hear what God has laid on your heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you so much just for allowing us uh, to be in your presence, Lord. To come and to, to be reminded through song of uh, that you're worthy to be worshipped, and that you have blessed us so incredibly richly. Or to be able to come into your presence and enjoy ourselves, to re- be reminded that the Christian life should be the funnest life there is to live, because we have the truth, and we also have this amazing fellowship with our Creator. Lord, I pray that today that we would look inwardly, that we would reflect on our lives, that we would ask ourselves, am I living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ? And Lord, if we're not, We know you invite us to repentance. 
You invite us to come sit in your lap and pour out our burdens and to confess our sins and to know that we'll be made right with you every single time because you're a loving, kind, good father. Lord, be with us as a church. Help us to be the church, to know that we're better together, to strive with one another, to roll up our sleeves and to work, Lord, because we believe there's a world around us that's hungry for some good news. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings he takes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in the one wonder the king Sing it out. Here we go. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. chaos back into order who makes the orphan the son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nation with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings